we are going to take a look at some alien technology that was described in this paper from 1967. The people of UMO wrote a paper about the computers that they use and developed on their planet. This document was originally written in Spanish, but I'm using the French translation that is then translated to English using Google Translate. And when you see words that look like this, these are the actual phonetic pronunciations of the words they use on planet UMO. Okay, so given all the translations, let's see if we can make some sense of this. The basic purpose of this paper is to highlight the differences between their computer equipment and our computer equipment. And we're going to need to go back to 1967 to remember what the state of computing was at that time. But before we do that, let's do a quick overview of the technology that is presented in this paper. First of all, the hardware that they use to do computations is not based on electronics. We use what we call capacitors and transistors. On UMO, they use the nucleus of the atom, and they have these hardware devices that are nuclear amplifiers. On the right side, you will see a teaching diagram of one of their nuclear amplifiers. And yes, it is an over-unity device, which means the input is small and the output is greater than the input. And you can also see some interesting parallels between this device and Bob Lazar's sport model reactor. In our digital computers, we use groups of transistors to do our calculations for us. For UMO computers, they use chemical reactions instead of transistors. They use 12 different symbols to count instead of our 10. And here is an example of their nuclear chemical reaction that is used for calculation. The next component is memory storage. They use blocks of titanium in a superconducting state in order to store their data. We are going to focus on this titanium data storage technology for this video. There's a small section on the input and output for their computers, and they do have three-dimensional displays, maybe like a hologram. And also, very much worth mentioning, is in their spaceship document, they talk about their information transmission or like their networking. They describe three different ways that they send and receive data over distances. And one of those ways seems to be a faster-than-light transmission method using nuclear resonance over short distances. Now, we can focus on their technology for data storage, but first, we need to go back to 1967 and better understand the state-of-the-art of the technology then. So we have these devices that were made in 1967. This is our portable music and the big screen TV that was actually a piece of furniture. And realize that there was no such thing as a personal computer. This is the first portable computing device that was made from semiconductors and transistors. But the display was still a tape and it had to be plugged into the wall. In terms of phone technology, the big deal in the mid-60s was the upgrade to the touch-tone telephone. And in terms of 1967 word processing, we have the portable non-electric typewriter, and then the new innovation was this selectric typewriter with the power cord. The new selectric typewriter had this electric head that smashed against the ribbon versus the full manual operation. And then we have the UMO crew that is writing papers telling us about these titanium crystal memories that store this many bits per cubic centimeter. This amount of bits translates to 100 petabytes 
to nearly 100 exabytes. Now, most people may not have a good reference to understand the mega, giga, tera, peta, exabyte ideas, so we'll come back to this. This is an example of the size for a one cubic centimeter titanium crystal that can potentially hold, let's just say, one exabyte of data. Now here is an example of a four inch cube of titanium. In the UMO papers, they have mentioned that on their planet, they have these cubes in terms of six feet by six feet, which would just store an unimaginable amount of data. So in terms of state-of-the-art computer systems, here we have the 1967 UNIVAC mainframe for the Manned Space Flight Center. And this is a row of magnetic tape storage devices because hard drives were not really technically feasible in 1967. And this is the UNIVAC mainframe's competitor. It's the IBM System 360 mainframe. And over here is the main console to tune and program this computer. And this is a close-up of the state-of-the-art 1967 mainframe console. And this shows you a version of that mainframe console in operation in a museum in Seattle. So, IBM was developing the hard disk technology that we are familiar with today and during the mid 60s it was like a top loading washing machine. These hard disk packs were loaded into these machines and let's just say these disk packs could store 1.5 megabytes which is equal to basically one picture on your iPhone 8. So you could imagine the UMO papers discussing one exabyte of data from a one centimeter cube of titanium would just be ridiculous. But today, hard drive technology has evolved greatly. And now we have these storages of petabytes and exabytes. So let's get a sense of scale. Let's start with one terabyte worth of storage. It takes eight iPhone 13s to equal one terabyte because the base memory storage is 128 gigabytes. So how much is one terabyte worth of data? It's 1613 old CD-ROMs, not DVDs, or 4.6 million books. How much is one petabyte worth of data? 20 million four door filing cabinets full of text. And here we are to the one exabyte UMO titanium cube, and that will hold 250 million DVDs. Now, what is the physical size requirement to achieve this petabyte and exabyte data storage with our current technology? What we'll do is look at Black Blaze, who is a cloud data storage provider. Each one of these is a physical hard drive that holds four terabytes or eight terabytes, depending upon the type of hard drive you purchase. Each enclosure of 60 hard drives fits into one slot of this cabinet. So there is almost five petabytes per cabinet you need 1,000 petabytes to equal one exabyte of the titanium storage cube. So that would mean you would need 200 of these racks to equal one exabyte, and you have eight racks pictured here. So 200 of these versus one of these titanium cubes. Now you have a sense of physical size for one exabyte of data storage. So how do these UMO titanium memories work? We just went over how Earth computer memory storage is very magnetic based. 
And what was very interesting to me is that they said they never went through a phase where they used magnetism for storage. Well, I didn't exactly explain how hard drives work, but they are based on magnetism, and you can check out Wikipedia to better understand that. The titanium cube technology is based upon what we call atomic spectroscopy. And then they explain the basic process based on our ideas of how the atoms work, which is basically the Niels Bohr atom. So they say right here that the emission spectrum of titanium is what they use as storage. These titanium blocks must be 100% pure. That purity allows the titanium block to be in a perfect crystalline form. They access each individual atom to encode or decode the information that is stored in the electron medium. And they access these atoms by very high frequency waves of light. We call these light waves gamma rays, and they use three beams to intersect each atom inside of this titanium cube. These gamma ray frequencies are very high. It allows these gamma ray beams to pass through the titanium block as if it was transparent. But this memory technology is enabled by the superposition of these three waves. When they come together, they utilize something that we know as beat frequencies. The beat frequency is what causes a much slower or lower frequency to occur. It is the lower or slower frequency of these beat waves that allow them to interact with the titanium atom and set its electron medium. Now, there's a lot of physics going on here, but it's not that difficult to understand. Let's take the key components and then dive another layer deeper to figure this stuff out. So we have a requirement for a 100% pure titanium cube. And most likely what that does is set up this perfect lattice. That way the beams can locate a single atom at the exact XYZ location every time. The width of a titanium atom is only 0.28 nanometers. What that means is this is below nanotech or picometer technology. Another requirement is the gamma ray frequency wave beams. How are you going to manipulate the atoms that are inside the middle of the metal titanium block? Well, you would have to start with wave beams that are high enough frequency that basically pass right through the metal as if it was transparent. But using gamma rays in terms of our current understanding of science means that these are very high energy photons. We have to take a small detour to understand that our thinking of these high energy photons is incorrect. Let's do a quick photon energy calculation. Each one of the three beams is 8.35 times 10 to the 21 hertz. E equals HF is Einstein's photon energy equation. We have almost 35 mega electron volts per photon. That is a high energy photon and in one second there are this many photons. So if you have one of those high energy photons and you shot one second worth of those then you would get 46 gigajoules of energy for one of those beams over one second of time. If you fired all three of those gamma ray beams then you would have 138 gigajoules worth of energy in one second. So let's try to make that energy a little bit more tangible. So we have about 38 megawatt hours 
and we can compare it to a single family home electricity use. In one single day, on average, it takes about 28.9 kilowatt hours of electrical energy to run a single family home. So if we divide that into the 38 megawatt hours, then those three beams running for one second, based on the idea of Einstein photon energy, would be enough power to run 1,315 houses for a full day. So obviously, if our calculation is somewhere in the ballpark, it just shows that having those three gamma ray beams on for one second is ridiculous. And it is ridiculous because the Einstein photon is wrong. And you can learn all about it in this video here. So this is an example of Einstein's pseudoscience being completely incompatible with UFO or UAP science. So now you have a better understanding why we would need gamma ray wave beams or gamma ray lasers that are a low energy technology. So now we move to superconducting titanium, which is kind of weird because we don't think of superconducting materials for data storage. Sure, we've thought of superconducting processors, like this 1980 article on the Josephson Junction, but using superconducting metals as a means of long-term data storage seems a bit odd. So to learn why we would do something like this, let's go back to 1893, Volume 1 of Oliver Heaviside's Electromagnetic Theory. He states that the perfect conductor, or the superconductor, is a perfect obstructor. So what does he mean by that? So the obstructor would be like a reflecting barrier. The energy of the waves stay within this bounded region, and they will be reflected in an endless series of crossings and recrossings. And the only way to stop this is to employ artful demons. This is heavy side humor. So these artful demons will absorb the energy of the waves passing them instead of generating more disturbances. So if you don't have any of these artful demons, then the energy will remain within the electromagnetic form and be in constant motion. Hmm. Let's get a better idea of the super obstructor from this Wikimedia video. We have a superconducting material in liquid nitrogen to keep it cool, and then we drop a magnet right on top of it. The superconductor fully obstructs the magnetic field of the magnet or repels the magnetic field of the magnet and causes it to float in midair. Now let's add another superconductor on top of the magnet. This superconductor will heat up and lose its ability to obstruct the magnetic field. So then we have the idea of electromagnetic waves that are trapped inside of this magnetic field. What would that look like? Maybe looking at cymatics can help us get some intuition on what the electron medium that is trapped inside of that titanium atom is doing. You can see when it vibrates at different rates, you will get different patterns of nodes and antinodes. And since it's in a superconducting environment, then these vibrational patterns will continue on until they are interrupted in some way. So this could be why you would want a superconducting environment for your memory storage. If you imagine each titanium atom enclosed in its own magnetic field, then any particular vibration can represent information. So we now have our mechanism for storing data inside this titanium atom as a perpetual vibration 
of the electron medium. Now, what is the mechanism to read and write to each individual atom? This is where the low energy gamma ray lasers or wave beams come into play and the use of atomic spectroscopy and a special form of wave interference which is beat frequency. Back to the UMO paper we have our diagram and our gamma emitters. I really doubt that these are moving parts like little robotic spot welders so we can only speculate how this part is actually implemented. They do give us this list of 10 numbers that correspond to 10 of the titanium spectral lines. So what does this mean? We take those 10 numbers and we add a decimal point and we get the units of angstrom. Then we can simply convert it to the more familiar wavelength of light. And now we have an idea of what spectral lines are being used in the titanium. So these discrete frequencies of light waves of the titanium atom are being used as the input and output system for each atom. These gamma ray beams cross at a specific atom. They create a specific frequency that is specific to a particular absorption line of the titanium atom. And this sets a particular vibration inside the titanium atom's electron medium. So the frequencies of these gamma waves are in the zettahertz range, which is just ridiculously fast. These waves are capable of crossing the block of titanium without affecting the nuclei of the titanium atoms. In other words, the block of titanium is basically transparent. So how does it affect the electron medium to set the information in each atom? This is where the beat frequencies come into play. Again, this is a special case of wave superposition. One of the most tangible beat frequency demonstrations is tuning a guitar. Yeah. So you can tune your guitar by ear using beat frequencies. Listen for the pulsating sound. The beat frequency will be faster when your guitar is further out of tune or the waves are further apart. Now, when I bring the waves closer together or when I bring the string closer into tune, listen for the beat frequency to get slower and slower. And when there is no beat frequency left, then your strings are in tune. You can also use an online simulator to understand beat frequencies. And here we will have a 2 hertz beat frequency. Or a 4 hertz. So you're combining two fast waves to simulate a slow wave. The UMO scientists are combining three very, very fast waves to simulate these much slower waves that get picked up by the absorption lines of the titanium atoms. And this beat frequency wave energy is what encodes each atom of titanium. You could think of each one of these frequencies as representing the information of a number, 0 through 9. That describes the right operation to each atom, but we still have to read the information and they only give us this one line. 
I'm going to guess that when these three beams cross an atom that is oscillating in a particular frequency, then it's going to create a beat frequency that their sensors would pick up. So sensing a beat frequency would be the read operation, and then there's the format operation, or erasing a particular cell. I'm going to guess that to erase the information, or reset the atom to its ground state, you would sense the beat frequency and send the same beat frequency back, but with the timing of destructive interference. Okay, so this concept of non-invasive three-dimensional matter manipulation could be used for all kinds of things. And if this concept interests you, I would recommend reading Juliana Mortensen's paper on a frequency-based theory of catalysts. It's a great introduction on how to use these electromagnetic frequencies to manipulate matter. And in terms of our newest storage technology, we are moving away from the spinning magnetic hard drive. The traditional hard drive is starting to be replaced by the solid state drive. Instead of using magnetism to store our data, we are starting to use dielectric polarization, or simply said, capacitors. You can see from this diagram that these solid state disks are built as three dimensional storage, but we are running tiny wires through the middle of it so we can get access to the data that's inside the three dimensional cube. And if you look at Microsoft Research, they are using lasers to three dimensionally etch data into quartz crystals. It's much like a CD ROM or read only memory but what it's doing is solving the problem with magnetic media deteriorating over time. These etched plates of glass will store data for thousands and thousands of years without deteriorating. So you can see that it's not exactly the Umo Titanium Cube, but it's a long ways away from the humble computing days of the 60s. And this only covers a couple of pages of UMO science documents that are available online. There are hundreds of pages to go through. If you are unfamiliar with the people from UMO, I have an introductory video that I'll leave here. And if you're interested in understanding more details about the Einstein pseudoscience of the photon light particle, this video will help. And thanks for watching.